Last month we finished up the second half of the Jedi Academy trilogy. This time we're taking a look at the origins of Exar Kun with the second block of Tales of the Jedi. While previous installments of the Tales of the Jedi series were predominantly penned by Tom Veitch, hey, that alliterates, this installment of Tales of the Jedi brings Kevin J. Anderson to the table. I'm not able to find any information about how they met. However, based on the timeline of the works leading up to this, I see the collaboration of the two either being pitched by Anderson as an opportunity to flesh out his new villain and tell an interesting story in the Tales era, or by Lucasfilm as sort of a next chapter in the saga, where Lucasfilm suggests, hey, bring you two work together and bring something from the ancient past of the Star Wars universe into the sort of modern era of where the story is going. Following the defeat of Queen Amanoa in the events of the first Tales of the Jedi storyline, Jedi Master Arka Jeth has decided it's best to remove the remains of Sith Lord Freedon Nad from Onderon to the nearby moon of Dixon, where all the beasts come that threaten everybody who lives on Onderon. As Jeth and his students Ulik and Kay Kaldroma and Tatanita along with Master Thawne's former pupil, pupil Os Willem, move Nad's sarcophagus and the remains of the former queen, Amanoa, to Dixon, they are attacked by followers of Nod, who steal the sarcophagi. The Jedi consult current queen, Gallia's father, King Amun, for assistance. To their surprise, but not exactly mine, Amun turns out to also be a Nad cultist, betraying the Jedi. Arkajeth is captured, so the rest of the Jedi get away. Meanwhile, another group of Jedi, including Nomi Sunrider, are sent to help defend the planet. While all of this is going on, two other Sith cultists, Satal and Alima Keto, heirs to the throne of the Empress Tita system, steal a book on the Sith from the Galactic Museum, which leads them to Onderon. They manage to steal a few relics of Freedom Nad, and return to their home system, and murder their parents to seize the throne. Once again, the Jedi are drawn into action to take down the two. As Republic and Jedi forces work to retake the Empress Tena system, a Jedi Knight named Exar Kun raids the crypt of Freedom Nad and also takes several relics. Nad's spirit directs Exar Kun to Yavin 4, and the temple and Sith laboratories of an earlier Lord of the Sith known as Naga Sadao. Nad manages to corrupt Kun to the dark side of the Force, forcing him to accept the mantle of the Sith in order to heal an otherwise mortal wound. Back in the Empress Tita system, the Keto siblings are able to fight the Republic forces to a standstill, using their Sith powers, and in particular Alima's ability to conjure illusions. As Kun Kun turns to the dark side, a wave of power runs through the Force. that allows the forces of the Keto siblings to attack a gathering of Jedi, with their battle droids killing a bunch of Jedi, including Master Death. In response to this, Oleg Keldroma proposes a hazardous plan to infiltrate the forces of the Empress Tita system and to attempt to overcome the Sith from within. Several Jedi Masters, along with Oleg's brother Kay and Nomi Sumrider, attempt to talk him out of this, 
but he decides to go forward with his plan anyway. Ulrich manages to gain the confidence of Alima, but Satal does not trust him, drugging him with a Sith poison that will kill him if he tries to draw on the light side of the Force. Kay and Nomi attempt to pull out Ulrich, but he insists on staying to see this through. This all comes to a head when Exar Kuhn travels to the Empress Tita system himself. Kuhn kills Satal and ends up doing battle with Ulrich. Ulrich puts on an amulet from the cache of Sith artifacts in Alima's possession, which resonates with a similar art amulet that Kuhn had on his person. They get a vision of a Sith Lord far, far older than Frida and Nad. He informs them that this moment had been planned for long before they were born. Exar Kuhn is to be the new, true Dark Lord of the Sith, with Ulrich Queld Kildroma as his apprentice. We learn that there is an ancient race known as the Sith, and they were enslaved by a group of Darth Jedi, which in turn came to call themselves the Lords of the Sith. We learn that the Force has something in common with Ki in the Wuxia novels, or humors in medieval medicine. It's not just a matter of mindset and intention when powers are used, it's mindset and body chemistry in unison. Thus, when Exar Kun's body is rebuilt by Freed and Nad, he can block Kun off from the light side. And the same applies for the Sith poison that is injected into Ulic Keldroma. We have our first mention in print of Korriban, the Sith tomb world, the place that they buried their secrets on their death, but specifically with the intent that later Sith lords would come and try to retrieve those secrets and thus place challenges that would have to be overcome to obtain them. And with the first appearance of the Empress Tita system and the first major mention of Naga Sadao. Ulrich Keldroma is still somewhat naive and brash, but also driven and idealistic, as he's willing to put everything on the line to infiltrate the Sith in order to end this war once and for all. K. Keldroma is still the more mature brother, as he tries to talk Ulrich out of his plan, and also tries to pull him out with Nomi Sunrider. At some point, Nomi Sunrider fell in love with Ulrich. We don't know when it happened off camera. She is a little more willing to use her lightsaber, and she's also demonstrated the ability to use battle meditation to get her opponents to turn on each other. Master Arka Jeth dies during the battle droid attack on the Jedi Gathering. Os Willem has a vision that he will be learning a great deal from Ulic Keldroma. This installment is a good job of building up the backstory for the events that are going on in the Jedi Academy trilogy, while also forwarding the existing tales of the Jedi storyline. That said, again, I feel this would work better as an ongoing comic rather than a short miniseries, but hey, that's how Dark Horse rolls in the 90s. This is a great continuation of the story from the last Tales of the Jedi series. This ups the scope to a more galactic threat and gets across why this is a big deal. The Keto siblings are generally introduced in an interesting manner. They're something of a archetype. Rich, decadent, spoiled brats who turn to occultism and bored. Almost the Star Wars equivalent of Fenris from the Marvel, Marvel Universe, but with less implied insight. That said, once Exar Kun is introduced in full in Dark Lords of the Sith, it's made clear that the Kato siblings are placeholder villains. They're certainly dangerous, but the amount of attention that Exar Kun receives makes it clear that he's the big bad. Something that's made all the more clear if you've already read Dark Apprentice. As we have. The action this volume, this volume is very well done. The environments and panel layouts and art all really works with the scope as well. We have some tremendous vistas in the story, which in the modern era of decompressed storytelling would probably be shown as massive two-page spreads, but here I count a little more confined. Still, they're given a lot of pages of real estate to play up the impact of the arc. The end of this part is definitely a cliffhanger, and it feels like our Empire Strikes Back moment, but we'll see when we get to part three of Tales of the Jedi with the Sith War. However, on the novel side, we need to finish off the Jedi Academy trilogy with Champions of the Force. 
And after that, we have, on the comics front, Dark Empire 2. Thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed the show, please like and subscribe, and please click the notification button to be notified whenever new episodes of this show go live. If you really like the show, please consider backing my Patreon at patreon.com slash count zero OR. Backers can view episodes up to one week early, and also pick future games for Let's Plays. Thank you for watching.